So welcome. We're so thrilled to have everyone here. I'm Amy Berg. It's my new last name, Berg. Um, and we are just so honored and thrilled to um, celebrate Melva's great accomplishment tonight. I think you all know that Melva's one of our treasured trustees of the Aspen Institute and has been one of the people that has kept the Aspen Institute going all these years and really encouraged us to incorporate the arts into everything that we do at the Aspen Institute and um, has been just a wonderful supporter. So we're thrilled to do this tonight for you, Melva. And interviewing Melva tonight is um, Heidi. Someone said Heidi doesn't really need a last name because she's like Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, <laughs> so I just had to use that tonight. It was so precious. <laughs> but I think that everyone in the room here knows Heidi and, um, and welcome Heidi. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Okay, great. So I was really flattered um, that Melva asked me to do the honors of having an interview. And um, I thought that we're going to talk about an exhibition that Melva curated at the Granary and the first exhibition that she curated, which is fantastic, and I had the great privilege of seeing it this fall. Um, but I wanted to start a little before that and ask you just to talk a little bit about your collecting and how you started to collect and also maybe raise collecting and, and bringing those two collections together. I started collecting when I was a child, like storybook dolls and glass animals and everything else and then grew into art. They were building the National Gallery when I was living in Washington, D.C., which I lived there for most of my, I guess now, less than half of my life. But I could go downtown with a nickel uh, at eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, and go visit the National Gallery by myself. It was very safe and easy to do that. And I just loved being in that National Gallery with all the art. It was, it was transformed into another world. And then when I could start collecting, I, well, well, first I wanted to be an artist. Well, the hand would never do what the head wanted it to do, so I had to get rid of that idea real quick. And then I started collecting. It was wonderful to be able to collect, just to collect fine art. And then when Ray and I met, I had been collecting minimalist art at the time, and Ray was in um, very edgy contemporary art. Well, it took me a year to do a 180 degree turn, and, and then my eye, I think, almost became his eye as well. We can walk into a gallery and go our separate ways and then meet at the door and say, which one did you like? Which pieces did you like? Which pieces did you like? And I would say 95% of the time, we always like the same pieces it, and we, because we've trained one another. But then when we did get married, we put Ray's, Ray has his own collection. I have my own collection. And then as we continue collecting, we have the Ray Mill collection. And I will tell you that every single piece is cataloged and <laughs> all with a chip on it. So we, we, it has an RFID system on it, and it's really quite impressive. So you're known for your incredible philanthropy and your support of so many organizations. Maybe you could tell a few stories. We were talking a little bit before this about the Des Moines Art Center and the impact you had there. It'd be great to hear just some of the things you're most proud of. The Des Moines Art Center is where I really grew up in art under the tutelage of Jim Demetrian and another friend um, who has since died. But Jim was the real tutor there. He would, you would not hear this today, but he would have a show at the Des Moines Art Center where everything was for sale. And they were all by great artists. And so he encouraged art collecting in Des Moines, Iowa, where there was a little bit. I mean, Andy was there at the time. Andy Gordon, my cousin, was there at the time, too. And, and he just encouraged people to start buying art. And I started out with taking art classes there. Then I, became, I was on the members council, and we just did all the little ancillary things for the museum. And then I went on the board and then became president of the board. And while I was president, uh, Julia Brown, then Terrell, was uh, the director of the museum. And we wanted to do a 
big sculpture garden. Well, we didn't quite get the big sculpture garden done, but we did get part of a sculpture garden done. And since then, uh, our family has given two pieces of art to downtown Des Moines. And then uh, Papa John's, who you've probably heard of, most of you've heard of John and Mary Papa John, have dedicated an incredible sculpture park in downtown Des Moines in an area called the Des Moines Vision Plan, which I helped to bring to Des Moines with Mario Gondelsonis, the architect in Yale University School of Architecture. So they tore down all these automobile dealerships that were kind of the entrance into the living room of Des Moines. And now it's, there's this wonderful sculpture park there. You can go in and Google Des Moines Sculpture Park and you'll see what's there. You'll, you will be amazed as Des Moines is a surprising place. And the Arts Center has three buildings. The first one designed by L.L. L. Saarinen, the second one by I.M. Pei, and the third one by Richard Meyer. So we have a collection of architects as well as art. And the art is really exceptional. When I go back, I'd love to visit all of my old friends there, not meaning people, but meaning the art. So talk, if you would, just a little bit also about your involvement with the Whitney Museum. Well, the Whitney Museum really started with Leonard Lauder. We were at a big dinner one night in the Temple of Dender, and he said, how's the Des Moines Art Center going? And I said, the Des Moines Art Center is going really great. I said, but I had to rotate off the Art Center board. So I rotated off, and he said, well, why don't you join the Whitney National Committee? And I said, OK. So then about three months later, I found I was on the Whitney National Committee, and then, um, Let's see, David Ross was director then, and then he asked me to be on the acquisitions committee. And then we just grew up in the ranks and been on the board, I don't know, about 18 years now. So we're going to talk about your exhibition in a few minutes. But um, you created this beautiful space for art. OK, so Ray has a farmhouse in Sharon, Connecticut. And as Ray likes to say, the closet was getting too small for me. So we, he said that I, we bought this other house so I could have a dressing room. And it's partially true. But on the property, there was a big barn. And I said, oh, Ray, we can tear that barn down, dig out a basement, make it waterproof, and build the barn back with still the old wood and make it into an art place for us. And uh, Chubb Insurance Company wasn't so happy about us building up an art museum, a little a gallery with old wood. So our architect one day came up with an idea of putting in this building. And you remember, Sharon is a very rural community. They're not, all the houses are rather old. And fortunately, we're about a quarter of a mile from the historic district. So this wasn't included in the historic district. And I was shocked, shocked when the uh, city fathers gave us the go ahead to build this building. So we did. So we built the building. And it was a labor of love with Stephen Lerner. And we looked at galleries. We looked at museums. We looked at floors. We looked at sideboards. We looked at lighting, ceilings, everything. And, and I think he came up with just a great design. You can't see the granite stone that's there on the right-hand side very well. But it took them months and months and months to find this granite. And I was like, Stephen, it's just stones. What are you looking for? And he said, we have to find the right stones. And then when he did, I understood why. So tell us a little bit about the impetus of curating the show. This is the first time you've curated a show after being around art and involved with art for such a long time? It was. Ray, who loves curating shows, excuse me, but my perpetual runny nose out here. Ray loves the curating. So the first, the first two shows at the Granary were Ray's. I allowed him to do that. And then I said, Ray, the next show is mine. And he said, really? What are you going to do? I mean, to take away his hanging a show is like taking away his very favorite sandbox. 
And he, I said, well, I'm going to do a show of all art by women. Now, all of us know how little women artists are represented in museums and in collections around the world. And I thought we had enough in our collection that we could put on a decent show. And I had never curated anything before. So he finally said, oh, OK. So Ryan Frank, who works for us, he's the director of the collection. Ryan and I worked together choosing the A, B, and C lists of all the women artists. And then we kept paring it down and took out artists who had been shown before by Ray. And, um, and finally figured out a good, a, a good marriage between these artists and then what would go together. And then it was putting it together. And I've never done this. And I guess I've been in the art world long enough that it was embedded in my head to be able to do it. And then we started hanging things together. And I would just go, oh, that looks really good. And you'll see the aha moment of this show is in one of the slides. And then when we did it, uh, and the opening was April of last year. It was curators, museum directors, collectors, artists who said, you have to do a, a catalog of this. Especially Ray encouraged me and Ann Temkin from Museum of Modern Art. She said, you have to do a catalog of this show. You've got to get it tr to travel. And I'm not interested in having it travel. It, it's our personal collection, but there are over 100 women artists in this show. Right. So tell us about the title. The distaff side. Okay. How many of you are familiar with the word distaff? Okay. So when I was younger, it was a long time ago, uh, the distaff side meant the, fam the woman's side of the family, the, all the women in a family. It meant the distaff side were women in an office place. The distaff side were women in the military. And when I, I have a favorite Scottish author, he said, why don't we dig up old words that aren't used any longer? So when we were trying to figure out a name for the show, I didn't want to use women or girls or whatever else, that we had to come up with something different. So I looked at Ray one day, I said, the distaff, and he said, the distaff side. And I said, that's it. <laughs> so the, a distaff is a, a spindle of yarn up here and the women would take that yarn and put it on another spindle down here. And that is a distaff, a real distaff. And it's explained in the catalog. Great. So let's look at some images. OK, but can you I want read, to read your text Can now? I do this? Of course. Yeah, yeah. So in doing research for this show, too, um, Jerry Saltz, you all know, is just such a great art critic. And Jerry and Roberta came up to see the show a few months ago. And not to write about it or anything else. They just came up with, with um, help me, Laurie Simmons and Tip Dunham. And they walked around. It was just, if you ever got anything out of them except for, a, it was unbelievable. And, but Jerry would say, whose piece of art is that? And I said, that's a local artist, and he would go and smile. This is the kind of show that they love, because it's not a cookie cutter collection. It's, it's so different and personal to Ray and to me. But I want you to read something, because that Jerry wrote in November last year. Nine years ago, I'm going to read it fast. Nine years ago this week, MoMA opened its brand new, shiny $750 million building. Since this garden of modernism reopened, I've been gibbering about the dearth of art by women in the museum's all-important permanent collection of painting and sculpture installed on the fourth and fifth floors. MoMA is modernism's mothership, so the way the story of modernism is told here is crucial, and the numbers are horrendous. At the 2004 grand opening show, there were 415 works on view on the museum's fourth and fifth floors. Of these, fewer than 20 were by women, less than 5%. In 2006, 19 were by women. A year later, the number was 14, which brings us to the present. I guess we can say that things are better. Today, by my count, there are 367 works of art on view on these two floors, and 29 of them are by women. That's just short of 8%, slightly less terrible, still unforgivable. 
It's entirely wrong to point fingers at MoMA's chief curator of painting and sculpture, Ann Temkin. And remember, Ann Temkin was the one who urged me one of you to do this book. Since she was appointed to the job in 2008, she has wrestled mightily against the museum's inadequate, unpleasant, cramped space, always trying to open up the story, wedge women in, place things other than the mega masterpieces on view. Temkin is obliged to show MoMA's many icons, lest audiences feel cheated out of their $25 admission. Yet women artists are being cheated out of something far more insidious, their birthright. Temkin continues to fight the terrible odds. I commend her and maybe even MoMA for trying to right this problem. Their lack of space has produced. Still, I sometimes wish MoMA would just chuck their master narrative for five years. It could keep Picasso, Matisse, Mondrian, Monet, Duchamp, and the other main men. But let's imagine if the curators could post a sign out front that reads, Pardon our appearance while we remove the stick from our asses, discard our atavistic, atavistic linear idea of art, and lay out more of the whole story. Then Timken could get her wish and install swaths of the collection with a far wider eye, plenty of it made by women. Of course, the problem isn't confined to the temple of modernism. It's systemic at our doorsteps and every day in the art world. Freeze. Assistant editor Paul Teasdale commented, we're supposed to be over misogynism, but it's becoming reinforced by a new generation. Berlin's new, Berlin's great Neue National Gallery recently mounted a huge survey on contemporary painting in Berlin. All guys. In one of Gagosian's large London spaces this fall, a 35 artist show included 34 men. Plenty of shows here are laced with testosterone too. No intelligent person thinks that art should be seen exclusively through a binary gender lens or bracketed in a category of women's art. So how does this all continue? I said this enough times and I'm done complaining about it. My own percentages stink too. I'm a glass house throwing bricks, curators, dealers, Museums, editors, we are all part of the problem. I hope that other critics might take up this cluck clucking, if only to notice and say something about what they see. MoMA will soon be building again, adding space for the permanent collection. Temkin has done what she can in the space allotted and the strictures given. Maybe when the next building is done, the gates will finally open. We all have to hope so. Till then, happy birthday, MoMA. <laughs> so. So now we can talk about the images. We can. But I had to get that in for That's good. <laughs> That's good. You're uh, preaching to the choir for me. So. so I thought what Melba could do is kind of walk us through the show. So we're starting off with some installation views. And so this is what you see when you first come in. Right. Well, the Elaine Rycheck is really the focus of the show. If you see in there, you're going to have to stand up over here. Um, Oh, there's the aha moment. You see, wait, with, wait, wait. This, with, is, this is advancing. Go on back. Its own. Yeah, go back to that. Okay, yeah. let's start there. So that's Jennifer Rubel, Prince William. And what you do is you stand up next to him. And if you see on his right arm, there's a little white dot there. That's actually a sapphire ring. And you stand up there next to him and slip your, your hand through the ring and get your picture taken with him. <laughs> and of course, Sarah Charlesworth on the right. And when the day that it opened, Sarah lived not far from us, and she came in and she saw that, and she went, oh, I'm right in the front gallery. <laughs> and she died about a month later. So that's how I will always remember her, of walking into the gallery that day with her face. And then, of course, the Jenny Holzer above. And in the book is reprinted the whole text of this, which takes up several pages. And then the Elaine Rychek, and in there is I Shop, Therefore I Am by, by Kruger. Uh-oh, I'm walking away and I shouldn't be doing this That's okay. with my, my microphone. Uh, and that was a, a real pivotal point. Go back. Yeah, I don't know. This going is too advancing fast. itself. I'm not, I'm not doing next, it. Next one. So, okay. okay. Okay, there is the um, Iska Greenfield Sanders on the left and the two pieces by Adriana Duque that Ray and I found at uh, FIAC, FIAC, FIAC in Paris. And I just, by Adriana, Adriana Duque is from Colombia, 
South America, and I thought they were just so beautiful. And then the Jenny Holzer bench in front and the Marina Abramovich video in the back where she's holding the pail of milk and eventually at the end of the video, one of the tracks spills the milk down the front of her dress. But without the other two pieces on the side, to me, I just love that black and white, that installation there. It's so beautiful. So one of the other things that is really important about this show is that it's all work by women, but it also includes women of color. And there's a really nice intermix. And that's a, another area of unrepresentation, particularly in museums. So it's very nice to have that as well. Thank you. Yes. OK. Um, Vera Luter, we bought that from Richard. In fact, I had sent him a photograph of it and forgotten I had sent it to him. And I said, oh, I want this. And he said, you already told me you wanted it. And so, and he, he, he found it for me. But we put the Vera Luter, which is a you know, reverse of, of uh, the Piazza San Miguel, uh, San, San Marco. Marco in Venice with the Vanessa Beecroft. OK. So I, some of you know what the relationship is, but how many of the rest of you know what the relationship is with the sailor standing on aboard the intrepid museum on the west side docks in New York and the scene of Venice? OK. They're both naval powers. Venice was a great, oh, yeah. great Thanks. naval power. And so, I mean, that's in my head. Of course, not in anybody else's head <laughs> that, I, that we're able to do that. But I love those two together. But now it is. And that's one of the great things about art and talking about it is now, whenever anyone sees these works again, they're going to remember the association <laughs> that you made with Venice. And this is Melvis Folly. So the artist is Mika Rottenberg. It's called Cheese. We saw this at the Whitney Biennial. And I, knowing we were building this building, I said, oh, we have room for that. Let's buy that. Well, it, when it comes down, it will probably go to a museum or a collector because we're not going to store it again. It costs more to store it than it costs to buy it. <laughs> but it is, and all of that came in pieces little pieces. So that whole installation was just laid out along the floor. And it took the installers, I don't know how many days, to put it together. And Mika was there at the same time. And she wanted to move that piece up against a wall. And I said, no, Mika, you're taking away space from other artists that we could hang. And she wasn't happy about it, but she finally said, OK. But then when you go inside, there are these videos of these women um, who are sisters. Of course, these are, are not the original sisters, the Summerfield sisters. And they make cheese, and they have this long, long hair. So the videos show you washing their hair, and the, they get the water to wash their hair from Niagara Falls. And so these videos show that. And then they show you with the goats, and they're making cheese, and it's just a delight to walk through it. It's just wonderful. And but when they wash their hair, one of them is up about two stories high, and her hair comes down, and they're all they're combing and brushing their hair and letting it dry, because it all goes beyond their feet. And you talked about the aha moment of the Elaine Rychek. And so just to point out the Barbara Kruger, Oh, yeah, right. The Barbara Kruger is right up there. When was the last time you, you laughed? Is that what mm -hmm. it said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When was the last time you laughed? And most of you here know that, that I was going through a difficult time to, through all of this. And I just love that. When was the last time you laughed? And here we have um, Yorinda Voigt in the background with the botanic code, whether it's really a botanic code or not, I don't know. But Ray and I saw this in Venice uh, and thought that the poles were just absolutely beautiful. And I love the way that looks. And Shanique Smith is on the right. When I first saw the images of that, I thought it was metal. And I thought, how would we ever store that? And then I went to the gallery and saw the pieces and just thought they were quite beautiful. And 
than the Rachel White Reed daybed we've had for a long, long time. And oh, Carla Roca, you can't see, she may be in it. And the Katie Scheimert is the, uh, the bust in the, back, in the background. So there are all these really nice things that happen in the show. There are the content associations, like you were talking about with the Vera Luter and the Vanessa Beecroft. There are right. these really beautiful formal associations that happen with the linearity of the, the paintings on the sides with the color and then the work exactly. against the wall. Yeah. And, and I so, love the way that looks. Yeah. So it's nice to kind of pick up on, on all, right. all of the different decisions that you made. Thank you. And there's the Carla Oroca, the uh, metal piece with Carla Klein in the background. And it's very interesting when we get students there. They love the Carla Klein. They hover around that Carla Klein for a long time and talk and talk and talk about it. And this is Anna Mendieta. Um, she did these photos when she was at the University of Iowa. She was adopted by an Iowa couple, and there are, there were, there were five or six of these images? Six. six. Well, we had, the, at one time, Ray and I had two lofts in downtown uh, Tribeca, and I had these hanging in the doorway of, of uh, our loft, my loft. And a delivery man was there one day, and he was looking, he's standing at the door, and he said, ma'am, is this a museum? And I said, no. And he said, is this your collection? I said, yes. And he said, I'd take those away from the front door. <laughs> uh, everyone's a critic. Yeah, everyone's a critic, right. And Micheline Thomas, a lot of you know Micheline. She's been out here, and this is her mother. And these are, our, you know, our women, a lot of women of color in here. Okay. And one of the things that's nice about this is the patterning of her dress against where she's sitting. And it's, it was a really great choice and where it was placed because you had that happening throughout the show with this idea of kind of pattern repetition, reminding you of what you had just seen and anticipating what you were going to find. And then the um, Kiki Smith with the Sharon Lockhart in the background. And there are several other photos on that wall and they all have to do with with a hand reaching up, so they, they go very well together. And I love that Kiki Smith. Yeah, that was a, Which is usually in our bedroom. <laughs> it's a really nice thing, because as you were walking through the show, you would start to get an idea of what you were thinking of and the associations, and then you would, it would become kind of a key for what you were seeking. And Mama Anderson, uh, where's Stephen? <laughs> Remember, huh. we first saw Mama Anderson at the Venice Biennale, and I went to Stephen right away. I said, Stephen, we have to have a Mama Anderson, and we have a, a few of them now, and they're, I just think her work is wonderful. We visited with her with the um, Aspen Art Museum, right? We went, right. To, we went to, vi to we visit went to with Karen. Yeah. That's right. And actually, the first work of art that I ever borrowed from you was a Mama Anderson for the show I did at R the Berkeley Art Museum. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you had it here, too, up yep. here. Oh. Yep. And this Katie Grannon, um, wonderful photographer, artist. I had that hanging next to my desk at the loft, and then one day I said, right, I can't have her hanging there anymore. You have to move it. We have to find something else because she was just too tough. But can you just imagine that? I mean, look at the, the string bikini, her shoes, the sitting by the roadside, and looking. It was just so painful to want, look at her every day. This work is really, I think, important to show because it talks about the fierceness of your collection and the fact that you guys don't shy away from tough images, tough artists, and also artists that aren't really known. And I told you when I walked through the show, there were artists that I didn't know that you know, were a revelation for me, as they were for Jerry and Roberta. And I think that's something really to be admired about what you guys are doing. Thank you. And it was great to have Heidi there because I knew that this was a show that Heidi would really like, and she did. That's true. Sharon Lockhart, um, you know, several of her pieces. And again, it's with the hands. It's up in that area with the Kiki Smith. And well, that one's in the back. Yeah. 
Okay. And it's interesting to look at her face and then to look at the next image. And an old Cindy Sherman piece. And the show kind of ends at this point with um, Marina Abramovich on the left, the um, Jennifer Steinkamp in the middle, and Cindy Sherman on the right. Those are the, the three images that you see there. And the show ends there. Oh. Oh. But I want to thank everyone from being here tonight. A few people I don't know, but I know most of you, but friends and family, thank you all for thank coming you. out tonight treat. and being That's here. So much fun. Well, you know, I think everyone has a book in them, and I never knew I had one. I always thought, oh, it'd probably be a cookbook. But when this opportunity <laughs> came up, I said, okay, I'm going to make this the best possible catalog that I can do and the best possible book I can do. And I think with the help of a lot of people, and I also want to thank the Institute, especially for when I told Amy that I had done this book, oh, we'll give you a book signing. And so I thought that was really pretty special. So I thank the Institute for doing this for me tonight. The Institute is really a very special place in our lives. So thank you all for being here. Thank you.